Hey everyone. Good morning. Good hey, morning. John. Welcome. Good morning Welcome, to Brian. you. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, welcome from, um, well, it's actually not sunny yet. It's quite, it's quite early here in Sydney. Just uh, excited to see everyone here chatting away and always super excited to be presenting uh, for you. And I uh, just hope everyone is safe and healthy in, um, in today's crazy world. Let's, um, let's get straight into it because I've got a lot to cover. Um, I'm just going to just preview this. I'm just going to make my screen full. So this is the spot that we're going to talk about today. Um, this isn't actually a real spot that was broadcast. This is something I created um, to really showcase some of the distortion and glitch effects in Sapphire, but also using plenty of After Effects effects as well. So I always, I always like creating this kind of thing. It's just something I can just put on some music and just let my creativity run wild. Um, the whole thing is stock footage. So there's no, uh, other than the text, uh, there's nothing else. There's, uh, there's, we've used particular just for the particles, but everything is stock footage. So I haven't gone out and shot anything for this. So let's walk through it. I'm going to, um, not going to walk through it step by step, but I will um, cover all the key parts and I hope you'll be able to learn something from this. Now, the inspiration for this came from the amazing Kill Two Birds, and it was their night flies spot that actually Brian pointed out to me and um, mentioned that um, he, he liked these kind of glitchy effects that they'd used in this. So it's a really nice spot. I've always been a huge fan of grunge and glitch way, way back into my Foxtel days and uh, working on um, uh, movie promos. Always loved doing the horrors and the, and the sci-fis, being able to use glitch effects. It's one of the great things yeah, about Sapphire too. Shout out to Johnny Ulet um, at Kill Two Birds. Amazing, amazing spot. Really beautiful. Yeah, great inspiration. Um, yeah, so being able to use those uh, glitchy effects in, in Sapphire uh, really saved me a lot of time. Something that really caught my eye was this image here. And uh, this is a really interesting use of pixel sort. So we'll take a look at how I've used Sapphire to create that kind of look as well. Slightly, slightly different, different from that. So that was the inspiration for this. And uh, let's walk through what um, I created. So first of all, we have the, the edit. And I'm just going to preview this as I'm talking. So I wanted to find some, uh, some dramatic shots because I wanted this to sort of like have a kind of a sci-fi darker kind of feel. Um, and I was able to source some really good stock imagery, really quite emotive. And the edit didn't sort of come together and stay like it was locked in stone at the beginning. I actually sort of was sort of tweaking the edit um, quite a lot through the process and switching up my shots until I came in uh, and decided on the final main shots. But these are the main base shots that I use. Obviously I've added other shots to these. And these are 4K, um, this is 4K footage as well that I've been able to scale when necessary. Okay, let's jump into, let's jump into the inspiration for the overall look. Now, when I was doing some research and just doing some tests with the Sapphire effects, I played around with time warp RGB. Sapphire has some really good time warping effects. And if I just move to this frame here, Mike, I'll just preview this little section. It won't be totally obvious what you're looking at here, but what time warp RGB will do, will um, we'll shift, the, shift the timing of frames um, and it will change the channel of those shifted frames. So they should change the color of those frames, which is really nice. I mean, when in areas where the shot's not moving very much, you get this really nice sort of chromatic aberration kind of style. But in my pre-comp here, you can see I was just testing, I was sliding shots around and I had this shot butted up against this shot, just like that. Boom, boom. I just press shift escape. That'll take me back to that previous comp. But if you see this frame here, I just landed on that frame and I thought, whoa, 
that looks really good. So that was actually the inspiration for the entire look. I love the way these shots blended together. This uh, this talent's uh, the you know the cyan color is um, talent. The shadow is um, basically gone, and it's revealing the shot of the other talent behind. And really lovely crushed levels. So I thought this shot was great, but the my problem was that it was only one frame. Well, actually, in this case, two frames. Uh, so it wasn't really sort of wasn't sort of kind of lasting long enough. But it was enough to give me the inspiration to develop my look based on this. So I had to think of a way to recreate this look uh, across multiple frames. So that's what I started to do next. Let's go into composition number two. Now I've broken this down into multiple comps as I always do when I do these walkthroughs, just to make it easier for you to understand what I'm doing and also um, for me to present. Okay, just gonna give myself a little bit of space here. And let's just dig down into shot number one. We're gonna come back into this comp. And inside shot number one, I have shot number one base. And obviously this is the base. So this is where I've, uh, I've chosen, I've got my original shot and let me just turn this one on. There's my original shot and you can see I've scaled it up. That's like such a great shot, such a, uh, such a handsome guy and beautifully lit. Just it, half the work was done with the, with the lighting on this shot, just really lovely and nice, nice sharp, uh, crisp shot. So that was the main shot and you can see I've set the blend mode to screen. Okay, and then the screen's gonna drop, drop out all of the darker pixels. So if I drop this over the shot number two, well, I've named it shot number one B, but this is the second shot. You can see I actually have a mask on that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But if I combine those two shots, I get that. So that's pretty much what um, <clears throat> Time Warp RGB was giving me as far as how these two shots were combined. Um, and that was a good start to the process. But then I had to sort of colorize these. So let's look at the background one first. So this was the red one, right? So in the style frame, this was red. I'm just gonna turn that mask off for a moment. Just gonna hit M and just choose none. There's a reason for that mask. Okay, so to set the channel to red, which is what Time Warp RGB was doing, I use After Effects' channel mixer effect. And you can find channel mixer in the color correction uh, set of plugins, set of, set of effects or category, I should say. A channel mixer, just there. There's a few different plugins you can use or effects you can use to change the channel. This was the easiest for me. So you can see all I've done is I've just changed green, green and blue, blue to zero. And that leaves red, red and that gives me that red channel. But you can see it's not actually, uh, not enough contrast. Before Channel Mixer, I actually use Hotspots. Should have mentioned that one first. So Hotspots is a Sapphire effect and Hotspots basically just crushes the image. It's a really nice way to sort of apply levels or curves um, without having to do too many adjustments. You can see it just drops out those, um, it just crushes those blacks and it's a really, really handy effect to do that quite quickly. There is a threshold. It just works perfectly on these images. Hotspots so are hot my favorites, John. Hotspots, like old school Sapphire effect. Me yeah, I know, and it gets, it gets forgotten, Brian, because it, it, it okay. feels like, it seems like an effect that you just, well, that you use to find a threshold, you know, like After Effects' threshold effect, just make something black and white, just make it, just 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 find all the brightest pixels you know more like a utility effect but it can be a really creative effect as well really so hot spots cool day, day for nights with hot spots and like yeah i'm i'm always using it almost on everything yeah great effect great effect and uh follow that with channel mixer and um that's what we get so that's actually looking really nice it's lovely how his eyes are in darkness 
it's just such a great shot. You know, it's lit from above and you've got those shadows below. It's so, so nice. So that's, that's the uh, shot at the base and the shot above, same thing. Hotspots really works beautifully with this image. So nice. And this time just making it a cyan. So I've actually renamed that effect cyan. If you want to rename an effect, just select it and hit the enter key. Then you can name your effects, which is actually really handy just to keep things organized. So here I've just um, taken red, red down to zero. So that's what we had originally. And that gives me cyan. I had to do a bit of fiddling with these to work out which ones I had to adjust, but that was, that was pretty easy. So blue, uh, sorry, cyan with screen on top of red gave me that. And that looks super close to that time warp RGB look, right? So I was able to pretty quickly develop that look just based on that frame. And you can see it really looks good. And it, it's obviously the length of the shot as well. Now, when I got into this first frame, looking at it, I thought that kind of looks like he's looking down and that's his ear, so this, this um, front character. So that looks like his ear, it looks like one person. And I thought I might want to sort of like work on that to make that look a little bit more like it's one person. And then when he looks up and this guy in the background, when his head moves across, you go, ah, there's two people, not one person. So I kind of worked with that and I noticed that the shot in the background, you can see his nose, see his nose there. And that kind of gives the game away. So for that, I use a black solid. I've just named it nose hider. It's pretty, pretty logical, isn't it? This is a black solid, right? So stick that across on top of that one. And that just hides that. And I could, have, I could have tried to crush the levels or something, but of course, if I try and crush the levels, then I'm gonna lose all this lovely fall off on the edge. So it's just, it's just as easy because this is all pretty much totally black. We have a look at the, let's go window info. Um, if I just have a look up here, see where it says RGB, top right. If I just move my cursor over that, see it says zero, zero, zero. So you can tell that's all black. So putting a black solid over there, it's, you're never going to see the line because it's all the same pixel values. Handy to use the info palette that way. Okay, just holding down the space bar to grab my hand grabber tool, just to reposition that. So that's looking really good. Like he's in total silhouette, looking lovely. And put this guy back on top and there he is. But you can see there's this section here as well and that needs to be hidden. So to do that, I just use another black solid. Let me just show the transparency grid. And you can see I've just put a nice soft feather on that solid and combined with these two, we get, get it much darker in this area here. You can also, you can still see a little bit of that fellow behind and that's where that mask comes in. Let me just, subtract that guy from behind. There we go. So just using a few, you know, well-placed masks just to hide a few things. And look at that first frame now, it's much better. If you, if you, if you kind of stretch your imagination a little bit, it, it's got a weird shaped head, but it kind of at first glance looks like one character. And that's, that's what I was going for. Let me just do a little quick preview of that. You can see he looks up and then nose hider. Yeah, someone said we should have a sapphire nose hider effect. Yeah. Uh, nose hider is just animated. The, the opacity is just um, animated. So it, so it fades out. So as he's looking up, that nose hider fades out and you start to see his nose, almost like the lights being turned on above uh, or he's moving into the light. And then we, it reveals his nose. But I think it, this kind of thing is really subtle, but I think it can make a big difference. It looks really intentional that these, these were shot together like this. And look when he puts his head back. That's really nice. That, that particular frame there is so lovely. And 
I did like the um, the cyan, but I wanted to start introducing a little more grayscale into this. And there's a reason for that in the following comps. You'll see that in a moment. Um, but if I just solo this layer here, you can see it's very, very faint. So it's basically shot 1A with a soft feathered mask, but I've used the black and white effect. I'm just gonna turn that on. Black and white is a useful After Effects um, standard effect. It comes from Photoshop. And the reason I like it for making a black and white image is because I can target the individual channels. Take a look at this. I've actually adjusted the magentas and if I reset that, it's gonna right click and reset. See how it loses some of that crispness? If I start to increase that, watch what happens to the pores on the skin. It actually looks like they're becoming sharper. So it increases the contrast and it also appears to increase the sharpness of it, which is really, really good. So I wanted increased contrast, but I wanted a little, more, a little bit more detail in there. So black and white's great for that. You can zero in on individual channels and it just makes your grayscale images just a little bit easier to um, to adjust and to customize. There's also a tint in here as well if you want to tint that. So if we just drop that on top like this, you can see see how it just pulls out a little bit of that cyan. It's really strong there. Just brightens him up a little bit and looks like almost like he has some blue lighting on the side but not so much on the front. So that's the sort of basic color grade. And inside here, I've also added a little bit of Sapphire's parallax strips. I love parallax strips. It gives you that kind of, um, how would you describe it, Brian? Um, it's that um, offset, um, or how does it describe it in the help? Yeah, it's like, you know, it takes an image Ref about- Refracted glass, right? Reflected glass, what, what genius wrote that? <laughs> that's what, but that, that, that's perfect refracting yeah. glass strips yeah. is exactly what it's like that was you was it brian <laughs> yeah no no i actually think i actually think larissa our head developer wrote that i always think of parallax strips as yeah like it's like that um take an image divide it into strips and offset them to kind of fake that parallax yeah and that and that and that's exactly what it does and this kind of effect but yeah, of course you can do it manually but doing it manually is really time consuming. It requires you to duplicate layers, use multiple masks. And even then, when if you're not quite happy with the look, you've got to move the masks around or someone comes and doesn't like it, you've got to change it. Here, um, it's all done pretty much automatically. See, I'm actually just moving the shift amount here and you can see how that's shifting that image, which I love that fractured look that this gives you. Um, but it also has a random seed. So once you've set it up kind of how you like it, then you can just adjust the random seed and you can audition slightly different looks, which is so, so useful. You can see I've actually animated the shift amount. You saw that shifting does this. So animating the shift amount will adds a little bit of that fracturing movement, which is really nice. So it sort of animates that offset. It's only subtle, but incre increases at the as the shot goes by. So at the beginning, we have none. As we play the shot, we start to get more and more. So it's like he's, you know, he's normal at first, but something's going wrong. He's starting to fracture. You know, relationships are fracturing or something just adds a little bit of mystery to it. So that's a really handy effect and one that I love using in Sapphire. So that's the base. Let me just come into, I'm going to right click and choose, uh, let's see, reveal composition in project. I've actually just done a, um, a proxy of this. I've rendered a proxy, so I'm gonna turn that on and that just makes things a little faster. There we go. Okay, so let's go back into this comp and let's take a look at how I treated that. So all of that work was done in the pre-comp and in this comp, this is where I added all of the glitchy effects and displacement. And let's see, I want to turn off the proxy for this as well. So this is shot one. 
Okay, so there's there's the shot we just looked at. So let's take a look at how that glitchy look was built. And I've got all the effects over here in my effect control panel, combination of Sapphire effects and After Effects effects. The first effect is displacement map. I love a bit of displacement map. And to use displacement map, then of course you need a map. And for my displacement map layer, I've used this grunge layer. And the grunge layer is, of course, Sapphire Grunge. Now, it's easy enough to find stock imagery, but this is all built in to Sapphire. And grunge is a super handy effect for creating grungy looks. You can use a variety of different stamps. You can see in here, I've used like one watercolor drops, and I've used a stamp called Frost. And I've also used a stamp called Splotches. And this is based on a preset that I, that I applied and then I just made some adjustments. Just change the colors of them. And if I wanna make variations, I can quickly just go in and you know, change the different stamps and that will change up the look. So that's nice. So yeah, I could use a stock shot, but this is a live grungy effect that I can uh, change up and make different versions of really quickly inside of After Effects and the other host that supports Sapphire. So I'm gonna just turn that off because that's only being used as a displacement map. Let's just turn on shot one base. And let's turn on displacement map. So that's what it does. You can see I've uh, adjusted the horizontal and vertical displacement, not so much on the vertical, more on the horizontal. And that's giving us this look. See how it's tearing that apart. That's really nice. Look at those edges, beautiful raggedy edges and also in here you can see this is really pretty all based on that grunge image it has torn it across fairly far and you can see this black area here and you can see that actually is transparency so that's something I, in most of the shots i had to um, either hide or adjust so that's the displacement map you can see it's actually torn the image up quite dramatically Next effect in the stack is again, parallax strips. And this is a little more intense application of parallax strips. If I just turn that on, you can see, I've just gone in and for the relative height, I've decreased that for parallax strips. You can see that's quite low. If I just increase that, you can see it makes those strips much thicker, but I wanted them quite thin and, you know, gone through and adjusted the depth, literally just, with these effects, I'm just going in and tweaking the parameters, just sliding them. You can see they're quite responsive until I've got a zero in on a, on a style that I like. I really like those really thin ones as well. That's lovely. So we've got that original displacement or a parallax strips in the pre-comp, and then we've got another parallax strips on top. And I think to get these effects of these looks looking really good, you have to layer these effects you know, more than once. Okay, so that's parallax strips. So we've got a really grungy edge, and then we've got this super, super sharp edge as well. And I, I didn't really want that super sharpness. So I've applied displacement map again, just duplicated it with grunge. And of course, that's the next effect in the stack. So that's just displacing everything and including the parallax strips. And you can see I've got, just used a vertical displacement of five. So just a really tiny amount. But if I do too much, it really, starts to tear it apart like that. And that's not what I want. But just a little touch of displacement. If I just zoom in here, you look at this edge, a little touch of displacement, and you can see that's what it does. Obviously, if I was to put displaced parallax strips first, then that would be affected by the first displacement map. And I mean, it does it, does it okay probably because I'm not using much, but I could have actually done that. It's not using much vertical displacement, the very first displacement map effect. So, and this is what happens when you're working on a project, you're building it in a certain way, and then you get to the end, but then you, then you revisit it and you think, oh, I could have done it that way. So I probably could have missed out on that second displacement map effect, but the, the, you know, the look is slightly different. Hey John, quick question from the, sure. from the audience. Um, if you were to select the wrap pixels in displacement map uh, in edge behavior, what, what would that actually do? Yeah, let me have a look. Um, nothing. 
Yeah, I think I tested a few things and um, oh, that's, the, that's the wrong one. Sorry, let me try this one. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, does it? Yeah, it did, it did, right? But it filled it with this bright red, which is, yeah, it's a good point. And thank, thanks for calling that out. It does hide the, um, uh, the transparency, but it fills it with this red. And I guess it's because it's wrapping the red pixels from the left-hand side. So if you like that, cool. And if you need to fill in that transparent area, then wrap pixels. Absolutely. Good call. Cool. Thanks, John. Um, so let's see, what's next? So displacement map and then pixel sort. I love a bit of Sapphire pixel sort. It gives that real techie look. So let me just turn that on. So you can see pixel sort is just pulling little strips out of this. And I've got a little bit of, um, I've got some horizontal displacement. Uh, sorry, wrong one. Parallax strips, uh, pixel sort. Um, I've, t I've changed sort type to red. So it's working a little bit harder on the red pixels. And you can see I've actually animated soften threshold mask. I've got keyframes for that. And that's what's animating the length of these. If I just drag that, I'm going to set a keyframe, but it doesn't matter. If I just drag that, see how by animating that, that's what's changing the length of them. And that's what I wanted. I didn't want them to be stationary. I wanted them to just be sort of smearing across like that. So I just added a few keyframes for soften threshold mask. And I've also mixed it with the source slightly. See, that's the, that's the full on version, but just mixing it with the source just knocks it back a little bit because it can be pretty intense. It's quite strong. So just mixing it with the source fixes that a little bit. And lastly, once again, this is giving me fairly straight lines. So I've used a bit of After Effects Turbulent Displace, Turbulent Displace, just to give a bit of waviness to these. Let me turn that on. You can see how that gives the waviness. And that was definitely inspired by Night Flyers. I looked at a couple of frames of night flyers and, and it looked like uh, looked like that. Love a bit of turbulent displace as well. So that's the base. And I've used these uh, this stack of effects for pretty much all of the shots. We'll look at that in a moment. It's, it's looking good, but it's obviously way too much. And it needs a little more work. So I've actually added a second version of that without the effects on top. You can see that just like that. So that's our original shot one base on top of that look. And that's already helping. So we're getting all of that great glitchy, grungy value, but we're controlling where it's actually applying to the shot just by adding another version of the shot on top and masking it out like that. It's really nice, just adjusting the mask until it looks like you want it to look. So obviously I need to bring that right out like that. I mean, he, this is such a great shot. His eyes so strong. Couldn't I couldn't let that um, couldn't let that be be distorted too much. I actually ended up focusing quite strongly on that. Okay, I've added another pixel sort above that, and you can see. Remember, we looked at that night flyer shot where I said I was inspired by the pixel sort. I basically created exactly the same look as night flyers, and for this one. I've actually changed the sort angle. If I just make the sort angle zero, you can see that's the kind of look that Night Flyers had. It was horizontal, but making it more vertical, it, to me, when I did this, it kind of looked like paint. It was kind of almost like the image was um, kind of like t dripping techie paint. And um, I also adjusted the, let's see, um, the randomly restart sort value. If I just reset that, at 100, it gives you that more broken up kind of feel. But if you drop random restart sort right down to zero, it blends a lot of those lines together, which is really nice. It gives you that more sort of gradient feel. And that looked terrific on top of that. So I got, that's a shot by itself. It basically obviously only affecting the brighter areas and combined, they look like that. And on top of this one, 
I've used, remember I talked about wanting to sort of highlight the eye. I've actually used the same shot again, shot one base, and I've used black and white, and I've just masked that out so only the eye becomes black and white. So we get that kind of feel. And the reason I've done that is because I've used Time Warp RGB again, but this time as an adjustment layer. Watch what happens when I, when I turn Time Warp RGB on. Check out the eye. So that's great, because obviously he's moving. So we're getting a little bit of that red, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of that cyan reintroduced back in, which is really nice. Especially down here, you can just get a little bit of that warp. It's much more obvious um, because that shot is, because this section is black and white than if it's if it was blue. So that really sort of focuses in on the eye. Just like that, looks really good. And Time Warp RGB is super simple to use. Just, just adjust the, the shift frames of values until you zero in on the look that you like. On top of that, I've used a um, I've used a, a sapphire builder effect. It's one that created by Alan Lawrence. It's called Ripple Warp. I'm just going to turn it on, and what this is doing, it gives me this uh, sort of TV lines kind of look. But there's more to it than that. Let me just I'm just going to save this, and I'm going to go in and click Edit Effect to open up S Effect. Now the Sapphire effect is in uh, Sapphire and it allows me to build new effects from other Sapphire effects. And there's tons and tons of effect um, presets in Sapphire Builder, Sapphire effect presets. And this one was built, let me just make a bit of space. This one was built by Alan um, using, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna walk right through this. I just wanna show you the variety of effects that he's used. So he's used a little bit of Sapphire Shake with a little bit of S Warp Bubble and some Warp Chroma. You can see the effects across here on the right. You can see how it's affecting the image over here. Over here. Uh, a little bit of Sapphire Glow Rainbow and a little bit of Scan Lines. And then he's used uh, S Layer to combine and a little bit of color correction. And then he gets the finished result. And he saved that as a, as a preset, which I can just drop onto my shot. So SFX is a great way to create custom effects. And these can be shared across all the platforms that support, all the hosts that support Sapphire and use Sapphire Builder. So I've just used Ripple Warp, and I think I've just played around with the uh, settings just slightly and got that look. And you see, I've actually used a mask just to sort of isolate that to the eye once again. And lastly for this, I just use Sapphire Free Lens. Free Lens is an effect that gives you that effect where if you're shooting manually with an SLR camera and you take the lens off and you, you move it in and out, it gives you that kind of, uh, those lighting effects. So it's got a little bit of chromatic, chromatic aberration and um, light leak and a little bit of um, uh, blur in there. And I like to apply it on top as an adjustment layer and just play around with the settings a little bit. Let me just turn back on the, where am I, shot one. Turn back on the render and you can see, we've got this kind of effect. So I've got a little bit of brightness in certain areas. It's got a little bit of, um, defocus in certain areas, a little bit of light leak. And I have to tell you, I didn't really do too much with it. I just applied a preset and just tweaked the parameters slightly until I found something that I liked. But it just it just brightened it up um, just a little bit more. And I liked that sort of blurriness that it gave me. And that was basically the um, the finished shot for that particular shot. And once I'd done that shot, then I based everything else on top, uh, based everything else on that shot. So we're gonna quickly go a little bit faster through the rest because it's all um, based on that.
Okay, so shot two. Shot two base. So once again, building everything up um, from a base. So there's that shot there. We saw how we treated this uh, as far as colorization. A little bit of a black veil, so a black feathered mask to hide that area on the right. There's the second shot with the cyan treatment. And duplicated that shot and masked it out. So I just duplicated it to add a little sort of cyan strip on the left-hand side here. A little bit of brightness on the cheek because I needed that in the next comp because she was slightly dark there. And I've used the light and blend mode. And I've used another piece of stock footage down here, just, some, just sort of sort of a digital readout, which I thought looked kind of techy as I was searching for stock footage. And of course, a little bit of parallax strips as well. So pretty much the same treatment as um, shot one base. And in here, let me just turn off the proxy. Just reveal that in here. Okay, so just quickly walking through this one. Just let that redraw. So bottom one had a few less effects. You can see it's got pixel sort and turbulent displace. We saw why I use turbulent displace. And most of the pixel sort is happening on the in the red. The shot above that has all of the displacement effects. So this is like that displacement sandwich there. And that sits on top like that, which is really nice. I've used the light and blend mode. If I just change that to normal, you can see that's the actual shot. But I like to play with blend modes to see how these will combine. And using lighten was great. It made a really nice combination of those two. You can still see her eye quite well. Always playing with blend modes to see how they um, will combine shots. On top of that is, uh, once again, a little feathered mask just to bring back in a little bit more of that, which just makes that even, even better. Important that she's not too damaged. On top of that is the same for the blue one. You can see there's a little bit of that being reintroduced just over there. Just rebuilding it to make sure that I'm pulling in uh, a bit of the original footage. I didn't want it too, um, too distorted. And on top of that is, let me just turn these guys off. Once again, adding in some of the gray, I've added a, a bit more for her than the, than the previous shot. Just a creative decision. Um, a bit of ripple warp. Let's turn that on. And a bit of time warp RGB. You can see this is exactly the same as the previous shot. And this is really nice. Watch what happens around her glasses. See that? With the time warp RGB, this is pulling in, pulling out just some red and cyan, and that's so good because you've got the cyan on the right, the red on the left with a bit of cyan, and now you've got all this grayscale, but a little bit of red and cyan in here as well. So time warp RGB works beautifully for this. It just it just helps marry everything together. And a bit of freelance on top of that. So that's shot two. You can see the freelance, it gives you that slight blurriness without you know blurring it too much shot three this is once again very similar there's just a few key differences in this shot uh, let's go to the base so for this one i had the talent putting his hands up to his face like that and once again same red treatment I've actually duplicated it and just masked that, that one out here because I, his eye was in darkness. His left eye was in darkness at the very beginning. You see there, if I turn that off, 
you can see it's in darkness. And these these kind of adjustments, this particular adjustment here was made later when I was in the in the main comp. And I just wanted to see his eye a bit more. So I come back into this comp, duplicate it and just brighten it up a little bit. Obviously wouldn't have done that from the very beginning. It would have been something I did as I was working just to brighten that up. Uh, I've got, let's see, I've got this uh, sinking shot, the person falling into the water. And also another black veil, I like to call them veils, it's just a soft black feathered mask, just to hide a little bit of this area here, just to bring it off into darkness. And once again, parallax strips. So you can see there's definitely a theme now. Once I got the first look, then I could develop the other shots based on that and just make slight adjustments. Let's have a look. If I just turn off the proxy, what's this is um, shot three. Let's have a look quickly how this one was built up. I got the right one. Let's just reveal that. Oops, wrong one. There's shot three. Okay, so once again, just by way of review, there's my little um, displacement sandwich there. Different effects, obviously adjusting them slightly depending on the footage. This one, there's the great, there's the black and white shot sitting on top of that. And this this gentleman being Caucasian, he was a little bit harder to handle because, um, I, and also he's lit more from the front. So I was doing some feathering and I thought it's not really working how the other shots were working. So I actually changed this up a little bit. I ended up um, using this here. This is the um, displaced version, just masked out. If I just come down and grab the masks and just turn these off. So there's the displaced version, just turn those back on again. I actually added that on top because I just like the way it revealed this strip down the middle. I wanted some black and white, but I didn't want too much. And I just, his, his, uh, he covers his eye as well. So I, it was pretty difficult to make his eye black and white. Um, then it would just make his fingertips black and white when he puts his hands up. Um, so I thought this strip actually worked quite well. And that was just done by displacing it and masking it like that. See how it hides that little feathered edge as well, which is really nice. And some pixel sort above that. This pixel sort is more aimed at this cyan area because I had enough on this right hand side. You can see this is masked off. So adding a little bit of pixel sort over here. And once again, ripple warp, time warp RGB and free lens. All slightly tweaked because obviously these shots are different from the previous shots. And once again, look at that time warp RGB, just pulling in that really nice displacement, that time displacement there or channel displacement. That really helps a lot. One little thing that I did add later was the eye. If we come over here, you can see, where is the eye? Turn this on. So the eye is, the eye is a um, adjustment layer. You can see I've just duplicated the shot and I've just used channel mixer again in cyan and just added a few it's just a few keyframes for masks. It didn't. It wasn't worth tracking this. I just did this manually. Just a um, an add mask and then a subtract mask just to remove the eyelid. And just I just thought that also I thought about adding some you know some some sort of sci-fi thing to the eyeball, but uh, that was a bit too much. So I thought just making it cyan just added that little pop. Let me just turn that. You can see it just adds that little pop in there, which is really nice. It breaks up that strip of grayscale. Uh, and it also, so you sort of focus in on it too. It's really nice the way it does that. You know, what is he? He's an android or something. You know, he's, it's, it's more than human, right? 
And that, then that frame there is great. I think that looks really nice. It's got an edginess to it. So that's shot three. Uh, and shot four, just a slight difference for this one the way in the way in the way the shots were combined. So here we've got this shot in the background, just the talent walking along the train tracks. I really liked the this uh, um, the way the train tracks were on this one, the perspective. And on top of that is this shot. I've reused the shot that we used in the first shot. And you can see I've just masked it slightly. And that gives you the nice glow on the sides. And on top of that, I've just created, used two shots. Let me just turn off the luma mat. So I've used the hands. There's the hands there, they're masked out. But I've also used the same shot, this guy here, but I've used him as a luma mat. He has a fair bit of contrast. So all I had to do was just apply him as a luma mat by choosing the layer below and choosing luma mat. I think it was a inverted mat. There you go, like that. So you're choosing an inverted mat basically uses him as a luma mat for the hands. So most of the rest of it is transparent, which is really good. But sitting on top of the rest of it gives you this. So let me just turn that off. Isn't that nice? So having the hands on top without the luma mat would have given me sort of a soft feather. You can start to see the hands, like see over in here, and it just doesn't work quite as well, but just using him, the same shot to mat out the hands, makes it much cleaner, you can see that. So always be looking <clears throat> when you're doing your compositing, always be looking for how do you can use the shot itself without having to use um, masks. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> just have a drink of water. <clears throat> now I've, I've used the shot just as it was without having to use masks or rotoscoping or anything like that, or rotobrush. And that gives a really interesting shot there. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back into this one. And I'm not going to walk through this one because it's basically the same thing. You can see all of the same treatment to give me this particular look. And here sort of focusing on this area here. So let's have a look at what was done next. So once that was done, the next thing was to add in the particles. I'm just going to reveal that once again in the project and turn off the proxy. So that's the that was the finished shot in the pre-comp. Now to add the sort of more techy feel, I've used particle illusion. And this was a really super fast thing to do. I've got um, Boris Continuum on this machine and Boris Continuum has Particle Illusion. If you don't have Boris Continuum yet, you can use the standalone free version of Particle Illusion, which you can download. Um, the difference here is that in Particle Illusion standalone, the difference in my workflow was that I just used one of the Continuum presets. So this is, these are <clears throat> Particle Illusion emitters that have been uh, modified and created as presets that you can apply, apply directly from the uh, effect control panel. So I just used, uh, which one was it? Um, <clears throat> it was, <clears throat> excuse me. It was, let's see, data, data flow. <clears throat> and literally just applied it on top. The only thing I did though was come into Particle Illusion just by clicking launch Particle Illusion. It was called data stream, excuse me. It was designed as a lower third. Going to bring particle illusion onto this screen. Let me just scale that down a little bit. It just opened up on my other monitor. Let's see if it opens up here. There we go. So this was um, uh, a preset emitter inside of particle illusion, and it was called News Ticker. All I've done, I didn't like the numbers on News Ticker. If I just do a search here, News. Just searching in my presets. There we go, news ticker. If I just select that and click play, 
that's the preset. Now, I didn't want the words or the numbers. It looked a little bit retro for what I wanted. So they're particles. I just literally went into the emitter and turned off numbers and turned off text just by choosing um, uh, disable. You can see it says enable now because it's disabled. So I've just disabled those. And that gives me that nice sort of techie movement. I haven't had to do any work. <laughs> I haven't had to go in and build that from scratch, which is a, a fantastic time saver. Just cancel that. And just laid that on top using the soft light blend mode. It was already red and, and white, so it kind of worked perfectly in here. You see, it really adds to that, that sort of techie feel. I just wanted to add a sort of a techie element in there without having to do too much work, basically. Just like that. Okay, so once I got there, I really wanted to add some text. And the hardest thing about adding the text was working out what I wanted to add. I mean, literally what the text was gonna be. I tried a bunch of different things. I didn't want too much text. Um, and eventually I hit on this idea of, uh, let me just come back to the beginning. I hit on the idea of starting with L-I-E for lie and turning on the rest of the letters to make that believe. I thought believe, I, th I think I chose the word believe at start. I thought believe was a strong word and it looked really good in this font. And then I thought, okay, well, if I animate the tracking, then that will leave L-I-E at the start. So I thought I would just play with that. So as, a, as the viewer, um, you can see L-I-E for most of the spot. So you think, oh, lie, okay, something's going on here. Some kind of dramatic uh, relationship thing between these people on the spaceship or whatever. Um, so everything's built on lies, but then you see believe. So you know it's kind of um, uh, you're not sure whether it's lie. The title of the spot is believe or lie. Is it lie and you should believe something, or is it believe and there's something about lies? It's it's I like that. There's, there's a kind of um, uh, I'm not sure of the word. I can't think of it, Brian. But um, there's a kind of a contrast between those two words. Lots of people really enjoying the presentation, John. Um, lots of love, lots of love for this beautiful design. Um, and lots of people really kind of enjoying seeing kind of behind the curtain in your your design process and your thinking as well. Um, oh, good, really cool. good. Yeah, that's, that's the whole point of these ones, isn't it? It's nice to have, um, to be able to see how it's sort of broken down. Yeah. Um, just, just to clarify, a lot of people were wondering about like what, um, you know, how you were able to pass these ideas past your client. Um, so to clarify, like this is an internal project that you and I both worked on together. So uh, luckily we didn't have to deal too much with a client. <laughs> we had the creative freedom to kind of do what we want. Um, Absolutely. Is, you know, but but, but I would agree, approach this in exactly right? the same way. You know, I would approach this in exactly the same way. I mean, I... You in in this case, you were my client, so I was. Yeah. I showed you original original style frames. This is where I wanted to go. Um, we talked about the different kind of text, you know, wording that could be on there. Some 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 was a little bit e e e uh, uh, emotive, and um, we decided to move away from that. So definitely, the process was exactly the same as with a regular client, but we did have much more freedom. And obviously, as the director of motion graphics for Boris Effects, I can. Um, I can make suggestions um, that hold maybe a little bit more weight than if I was just a regular designer with a creative director and you know producers above me because there's always going to be changes and and different opinions yeah. in that case. One hundred percent, one hundred percent agreed. You know, I mean, I think the the fact that we're lucky is we're, we're doing this for this and we're both kind of experts at this stuff. I mean, I yeah. I, I think I, if you remember my my initial comments were like yes, <laughs> you know, like yeah fantastic like not having to sell this up the chain to someone else like um i think yeah. that really helps us and it finds it refreshing to just be able to create like a beautiful image and and kind of push the effects and push after effects yeah. and like yeah. what, what can we do but i i do remember going back and forth a lot right about that final edition of 
of the particles, right? Really took it from this emotive place um, to that sci-fi techie. Just that little yeah. tweak of adding in those PI textures really changed it, in my opinion. Yeah. And then it was like, oh, this looks like a, a Netflix show open now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. In the end, it ends up, ended up feeling like a um, like anything that you might see on, you know, any of the um, TV networks or, you know, uh, streaming platforms um, and, and approached in a very similar way. I'll just quickly go over the text. <clears throat> this is all done in After Effects. I won't go into too much detail here, but um, suffice it to say, um, I started, as I mentioned, with Believe and that's to animate the text it's all using uh after effects uh let's see <clears throat> after effects um animated properties you can see i've named them here just going to twirl that up and down <clears throat> i started with some tracking so to add the animated property for the text basically with after effects text you click on animate and you choose a different animated property i've used tracking in here and you can see I just use a massive tracking amount. So if I just turn that on, you can see, it's, I like it because it starts with the eye and then it tracks in at the end like that. And also opacity. And opacity is also been, it's been added by just once you've, uh, sorry, this is a separate, I haven't added it, sorry. Um, you can add to different animator groups like that by clicking add and they will, they'll use the same range selector, but I wanted a different range selector for opacity because I want it to only affect the B, E and V, E. So if I just turn the tracking off and turn opacity on, see how it just leaves the word, the, the letters L, I, E. And by animating um, the opacity, they fade in, see that? If I twirl open opacity, and you can see my range selector, you can see is set to subtract. So I've set my range to be around LIE, but rather than affecting that range, if I, if I choose add, you can see LIE will fade out. But so rather than affecting that range, I've chosen subtract and it, it affects everything outside the range, which is really nice. So that way I could have LIE come in with the tracking. And then at the very end, just gently have that, the rest of the letters fade in, which is really nice. You can do so much with After Effects text animation, really sort of subtle things. It's very powerful. And I added the numbers as a very sort of final thing um, because I wanted to add a little bit more techie stuff. And I thought, why, why have just numbers in there when, when I could put 2020? Um, and you can see at the very end, it finishes on 2020. And to do that, it was kind of working backwards. You can see I've got very similar tracking and opacity, but I've also got character offset and character offset is this one here, character offset. And character offset is what's making those numbers change. But in order to get it to finish at 2020, I basically use that as my starting point. So I typed in 2020, let me just turn off opacity. I typed in 2020 and turn off blur. And then I just ended up adding numbers. I just added random numbers there. I set a keyframe for character offset at the end. And then I came back to the beginning and then I changed the character offset. So that offsets all of the characters, including 2020. And then animating back to that first keyframe makes you finish on 2020. Ta-da, which is real sneaky, isn't it? And just the other ones, uh, other effects, obviously opacity. So same thing, these will fade out as we get to 2020, like that. This pops into 2020 and also uh, the tracking. And one thing here that I really like is the text has its own blur. You can see animator property here, blur. And this was added years and years ago. I remember when it was first added at a meeting with the um, After Effects team at, at NAB years ago. And it was so useful and I was, asking, can you please put other effects here that we can use that could be animated using all of these um, great tools, the range selector and stuff, but it never got put in. You can see if I just turn it on and I'm gonna turn off the tracking for a moment and the opacity. 
See how I've used a range selector to affect only the text on the outside? And that's because Blur has its own range selector. And where is it? Range selector, advanced. And I've set the shape to round. So if you imagine that this, the shape is the fall off, so we've got kind of a, a different fall off by using round. If I just choose square, you can see it doesn't, it can hardly see any, but by choosing a different fall off, then I've got more blur on the edges and less on the middle. And it's just really nice. Of course, cool. yeah, I could add. I could use a mask with with a, you know with a um, uh, a rack defocus or something, sapphire rack defocus. But you're always going to get that transition at the mask edge where you go from sharpness to blur, like that sort of cross dissolve. This way, it's a real blur um, applied directly to the text without any masking. And then back in the main comp, obviously that text was white. So let me come back. We're almost finished now, so we're going to finish up in a moment. Uh, let me just turn off the proxy. And turn on the text. You can see the text is actually white at the end. I've got to make sure I turn believe on. Like that. Shift escape, take me back to the previous comp. Okay, so it's very difficult to see. So I'm just going to create a, uh, a new solid, just drop that down the bottom. Okay, so here just a couple of little tweaks using masks. You can see that um, I've got some masks applied. You can see on, the, on Believe I've got a mask um, just around the, word, around the word lie. And I've actually used uh, Sapphire Invert. So I just inverted that effect. I inverted that um, black to white using S invert. And the reason I'm able to apply it directly in this comp is because I've actually used, um, if I just type in comp, you can see under compositing options for invert, I've used masks. So these are, these are effect masks. Um, I've covered these in previous tutorials. Just means that I can apply the effect and the mask in the same composition without having to pre-comp. And if we just move the time indicator, so we have lie, and we're not doing anything else to lie. Lie always stays white, but you can see for 2020, it turns white at the very end. And that's because I've just animated the mask opacity, just auto-saving. Let's go mask. Uh, actually, I'll just type in mask opacity. And you can see for the numbers mask, I've just animated the mask opacity. So the mask is actually turned off at the beginning. So it, it won't show you the invert because now this is, an, this, is, this is a sapphire invert effect mask. So it's not gonna show me the white, but by animating the mask opacity, I can turn that effect but basically turn that mask on and that becomes white at the end, boom, like that. And the only other thing is a little bit of distortion. You can see I've used a little bit of displacement. I've got um, uh, displacement map, also masked. You can see how that's displacing that using the grunge. And that also is not everywhere. It's only, it's being keyframed. You can see down here, it's being keyframed to only affect it in certain places at certain times. So I literally did that randomly. I just uh, grabbed, I set up one with the mask, copied and pasted the keyframes at different points and also changed the mask position at different points. You can see I've changed the mask path using a hold keyframe. That way I've got this sort of displacement jumping around and only affecting little bits of the text rather than, you know, rather than affecting the whole thing. If I was to just to double click this, if it's all affected, it's not quite as interesting as just little parts of it being affected. And to really add the, the, the overall displacement, you get a lot of bang for your buck just from using digital damage, Sapphire's digital damage. Just dropping that on and using um, it pretty much at its defaults. And that's giving you all of this sort of 
breaking up of the text and sort of digital glitching. Another great effects, you know, parallax strips, digital damage, pixel sort, those three, the big three, really, really easy to use effects that you can literally just sort of drop on and give you, you know, amazing results. And let me just come back to my text. I just pre-rendered this so you can have a look at this. I also put a, just a blurred version of the text below and made it black, just made it black. So it gives me a little bit of a pop, helps the text pop out. But also when everything gets destroyed by the, interesting, look at this. You can see how, see how the white draws on at the beginning. I actually use a mask to do that, the eye. Just ignore the one below. I'll turn this off. I forgot to mention that. You don't see this at the very beginning because I animated a mask just so that the so that the white reveals itself. Which is really nice. So if I just preview that, you can see how that little eye just draws on. So you're getting lots of the glitchiness. And a lot of bang for your buck with digital damage, especially at the end here, where it goes up here in the corner. Really nice. It's nice not to just turn the digital damage off at the end. It's nice to just leave a little bit lingering. You get this little this little guy at the end, which is I really liked. Where is it? There, that one, that one there. I love that frame there. I didn't, I didn't keyframe that it just that's just how it happened you really when you're doing grunge effects it's really hard to do them manually um but it's it's much better to have effects that allow you to do them literally parametrically just you know drop it on tweak the settings a little bit and change the random seed and you're ready to go so that's the overall look and obviously we came back um at the end all I did was just added a few um, digital damage keyframes between the different shots, just to give it a little bit more um, grunginess. Let me just turn this off. Because we've got straight cuts between the four shots and I wanted to add a little bit sort of a glitchiness at the actual um, transition. So I used digital damage, you can see, I'm just turning it on and off there. Just a little bit of extra digital damage between the shots. So it's, it's used on an adjustment, no, it's, actually is it adjustment layer? No, it's not an adjustment layer, but it, it's, oh, it's crossing over two shots. So you can see it's the same digital damage, damage effects between two shots. So it just helps sort of tie those two shots together. And the final um, look, once again, So in the end, it was pretty simple. There wasn't a lot to do because once I developed the look, then it was basically taking that look and building the rest of the shot of the um, of the spot. Um, but pretty happy with the final result. And I also just faded it to black at the end as well. And I like how fading it to black, uh, I just use the levels effect and it just holds the LIE a little longer. It just lingers. You see when it fades out, you just see lie 2020 at the end. It just fades. It's one of those um, classic um, classic sort of filmic fades. I'll just quickly mention how I did that. Uh, where am I? Got 06. Got to find that shot one sec. Yeah, almost there. Uh, I won't search for it now because we're over time, but basically just using the levels effects and animating the input blacks and input whites. And it basically gives you that um, that more sort of filmic fade where, the, where I mean, in a film, the, the, the highlights are held more towards the end. So it's a kind of a, a, a hack to do, to do that. And that's the, uh, that's the end of the, um, of the seminar. Love it, Love it, John. Excellent, excellent work. Excellent presentation. Um, I know I speak for everyone where you know, I think a lot of people really, really got a lot of out of this presentation. So thank you so much for that.
Yeah, sorry, I couldn't get a few words in. I couldn't find the words a couple of times because it's so yeah. early here. I'm thinking, what was that word again? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I again, I, I know I speak for everybody. I mean, I could watch you just work on the type for an hour. That's really fascinating to me. That's really where I learned the most. All those little tips and tricks with the subtract. Also, what kind of crazy person puts time warp RGB on an adjustment layer? I didn't even know if that would work. <laughs> like, I always oh, think yeah. of that as a, a layer based effect, but. Uh, Really cool to see yeah, you jump great. into the, the old kind of like the dark corners of Sapphire with the, the time warps. You know, so many people think of lens flare and glow and blur. Um, and like, you know, it took me years before I stumbled kind of into that area with time warp, but really cool stuff. Oh, there's so many effects. If you're not, if you're not really digging into Sapphire, you're not making the most of your investment. You know, there's so many useful so effects true. in here. So true. Mm -hmm. I, I got one question that um, I'd like to ask you. Um, so Jason wanted to know, um, like, you know, what was the design process? Did you start in Photoshop? Did you stay in After Effects the whole time? He's guessing you stayed in After Effects um, and wanted to know, like, yeah, basically, like, what your process is for designing. And if if you were in After Effects, is it, like, how would you, like, render something out at print res if you needed to share with a client if you stayed in After Effects the whole time and didn't start in Photoshop? Yeah, they're great questions. I've always... I've pretty much always done my my frames in After Effects. I always thought it was illogical to design style frames in Photoshop when all of the effects and things I wanted to use were in After Effects. So um, true. Obviously, obviously now with Optics, Sapphire is in Photoshop, but um, I find there's another reason as well because as I'm developing, I'm thinking about animation. I'm I don't see any sense in animating in a stationary app um, like Photoshop, although it does have a timeline. Um, and then thinking, how am I going to animate it later? I'm actually thinking how animation is going to work as I'm designing the frames. So I do that all in After Effects. And if if a client needed print resolution, then that means I have to build it at that size. And I, I know plenty of people who um, will work in After Effects at a much larger comp size and then take that into Photoshop and save that as a you know 300 DPI frame. Um, so if I knew the client wanted, <clears throat> that'd be a question on the brief, you know will this be print resolution will it be printed out and if that's the case then uh, i would have to uh, build it at that higher res but i could also save a frame out to photoshop in after effects by saving layers to photoshop um, and then rebuild that in photoshop as a as a higher res as well if i needed a print frame so i just prefer to work in after effects all the way uh, believe it or not, everyone, we, we have a we have a friend, Jesse Newman, whose website is jessenewmanvfx.com. He he does um, large prints, like things that he prints to hang in museums, like museum quality work, all in After Effects, works at 30K. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you have a pretty beefy computer, but, you know, uses Sapphire because it is non-destructive at that large size, like stays away from Photoshop because he doesn't want to have to rasterize anything he wants to keep everything alive um so after effects is totally like you know capable of doing that now like you want to get into the side of you better have a you know pretty big gpu if you want to work at that large size and you're going to be dealing with massive you know after effects projects but um it is possible so thank you john lots of love from from motion works lots of milg <laughs> Uh, references in the, in the chat. So uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, it's always good to yeah. present to you. Cool. So thank you so much to John. Thank you so much for everyone uh, for joining us today, and hope to see everyone next week and show off brand new um, optics plugins for Photoshop. It'd be a fun one. Okay. So thanks so much. That's it for us. Um, thanks so much for attending, and thank you again, John. Appreciate such a great presentation. Thanks again. See you next time. Bye, All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye, everyone.